Okay, so we are entering our final segment of the Kids and Culture Camp Teachers Training, and we have our final presenter, Kathy Healy. She is a teacher at Merch Elementary School, and she also served in the Peace Corps for two years where she lived in Thailand, and she also works at a summer camp here in the D.C., Maryland area. I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for inviting me. My friend Anne told me about your camp last year. She came and spoke to you about India. So when she said that you were considering Thailand and she had given you my name, I was thrilled. And so if we were in Thailand right now, it would be the end of the school day and teacher be, teachers would be having tea and coffee. And guys, I mean you too. All three of you back there. You three. <laughs> and uh, they'd be having sweets, you know, a little sugar to get through that last part of the day. So I thought that's what I would bring so you could taste some Thai food. And the... Uh, uh, um, this is a in, this inside circle, which looks a little gooey, but is a little gooey. Is a cassava, sugared cassava, and it's known as um, uh, mun munchium, munchium, and it, it is yucca sugar and coconut milk. And there's also some coconut milk here for dipping if you want. And I brought toothpicks and um, napkins. And I won't be upset after you have some of this if you need to wash your hands. The um, green and pink are very common. It's kanom cham, and it is a, a gelatin kind of thing. And it is flour, sugar, and food coloring. It is a direct hit, um, sugar-wise. So it's <laughs> delicious. <laughs> so if I can just start these things around, and then please help yourself. And, um, you guys in the back, you too. And um, again, I won't be upset if you need to get up anything with sticky or sticky issues. And I uh, came to know Thailand as a Peace Corps volunteer. I was in, I was the very first year I was here in uh, Narati Wat, which was land that Thailand acquired after World War II due, due to the treaty. We'll get, we'll get back to that in a minute. And when we wanted to go somewhere interesting for lunch, we went down to the dock and got into a small boat and rowed about you know 20 minutes in the boat. And we were in Malaysia, and we would go and have Malaysian food for lunch, similar to you know maybe going to Bethesda for Italian or something. <laughs> yes. And this and um, this, and and they were so excited to have an English teacher there. Now, this was my son's 27, so count backwards. Um, when there was a John Wayne movie in town, they would just call school off and everybody, because the attitude would be, any exposure to English is good. Wow. So it was a pretty receptive environment, um, although not, I wouldn't say there was a strong English department. You know. And then the second year, I, so they changed me after a year. The second year, I came north, and I was in Phuket, which is uh, right up here. And you probably know Phuket as an international playground, two years three years now there was a tsunami there at, at uh, Christmas time and um, just waves of, of waters. I see a good question. I'm sorry to interrupt. But she, had, she had the same question that was in my head. It's Phuket, not Phuket. Like you would think PH would be it's PH, but Phuket. 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 Okay. Thank you. They pronounce the P. I think someone explained to me that it's easier for Westerners to, to call it Phuket, so Phuket. that is how we Okay, that's how we went along with that. And I have, so this, this is the country, and it is, as you have your handouts, and it is uh, bordered by several uh, countries, by Laos, Cambodia, uh, Indian Ocean, Andaman Bay, uh, Burma, and Vietnam. And this, the reason I'm pointing this out, this, this is the way the country looks. This, these are the, re the regions are fairly obvious, northeast, north, central, and south. Um, Thailand is interesting because it was never colonized by other countries. And they saw that happening and, re and reacted. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the three, three special kings that, that made that happen. And it was in the early 1800s through about, 19, through, through, through about 1910. Uh, so and this is the Thai, so this is the country and it's you can probably guess that it's agricultural and fishing and, and seafood uh, and it's it's right here in the Indian Ocean. Uh, this is the Thai flag and it is it is actually six stripes. Nation is red, religion is white, royal family and the king is blue, two stripes here and religion and nation, and those are the things that unify Thailand 
uh, and still do today, even though, as we know, there's been a lot of uh, political discussion and turmoil and protests there recently. This is not new to them. Uh, they have, once they started writing constitutions, they've had something like, it's a constitutional monarchy uh, as a form of government. And once they, they've had 14 or 15 constitutions, their constant is not, as we would say, change of government every four years. Their constant is the king. He is the, he is the bond through, through all the factions and has come forward many times during the years to encourage people to work together. So those are some of the common themes uh, for, the, for the country here. So you, have you had a chance to look at this? Everybody has. Okay, great. So instead of reading it to me, what I'd like to do is give you the information and, and uh, some, of it will, some of it I'll recognize from here and then just show you some of the things that I brought. And then, if you have any questions, we can discuss. And if I run, if I start to run too long, please, please give me a signal. Guys, if you have any questions, just speak up. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, I went to the uh, Thai embassy and asked them, told them what I, what we were doing, and asked them if they had any materials, and they did. Some posters that I will leave with you, and some. A picture of Thailand at a glance, which we, I'm going to use this, it's easier than making pictures, and also a story called The Elephant uh, and the Eagle, and um, I'm not going to read it to you, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's a great camp book, and it's also interesting because Thailand and the U.S. have been um, allies way before World War II when they were not allies, but uh, um, have been allies since since before the Civil War, and in the in I think 1833 we signed that we signed a treaty with Thailand called the the Treaty of Com Comedy and Commerce C O M I T Y, and that has been the basis for a very close relationship during the years. And our national symbol and their national symbol kind of characterized the the ongoing relationship of the eagle and the elephant, and. I was the president of the Thai American Society for several years, and um, every time there was a reception or something with both countries, they referred to the treaty of comedy, of friendship, and business, and uh, they used the two symbols of the eagle and the elephant for the for the relationship. Okay, and you don't have these yet. All right, let's just we'll just pass them back. Somebody, thanks, and then. This is, uh, this. everybody gets one of these too. Okay. So, as we're going through, what I'd like to do is just look at this kind of as we're going through. It's not a textbook, but I, I, what I have in the notes will uh, fit with this. Um, Thailand uh, is called the land of smiles, and that is because people are, being happy is very, very, important. Farrell Williams would be just fine in this country. <laughs> it is, uh, uh, it means um, sanuk, one of the famous words is sanuk. Sanuk mai, are you happy, are you okay? Are you, and it, it's not ha ha happy, but joyful, contented, and, and, and not even easy going, but at ease. That's, a, that's very important. And they're, they're um, Thailand, although it's named as, as land of smiles, Bangkok, is, Bangkok, the capital, is called City of Angels. So you, you see the theme. Uh, and this is some of the, the ancient, this is a picture of the ancient, uh, some of the ancient stories and folk tales. We are 12 hours, just in case you wonder, we are 12 hours time-wise difference. So 7 o'clock our time, 7 a.m. our time. Uh, and they have a monsoon season that runs several months a year, um, similar to, to Burma and Thailand. Uh, sim similar to their, their countries, neighboring countries. Uh, the, the next page so, shows some of the uh, history. Uh, Bang Xi'an was uh, a world, is a world heritage site, so they go back to the prehistoric times. In terms, in terms, they've had some political governmental changes, but they've been there that since prehistoric times. So nation, religion, and monarchy. Their flag has taken several forms during the years, and again, you see the elephant, the national symbol, and there's another symbol, which we'll, you'll see during the time, a Garuda, which is half bird, half man, 
um, from their ancient stories. This is a picture of the, the king of Thailand is uh, King Bumipol Agule. So on the script, on the, on the notes that you have, if you can get past the facts, the geography facts and stuff, because you'll, you'll have, just have to look those up when you need them. Um, I'd like to talk about King, King uh, Kumipo, who is who's known officially as Rama the Ninth. And he has been an interesting ally of the United States as well because he was born here. And he had, he was, his father was studying medicine in Cambridge and they were here. They were part of the royal family that did not expect to ascend to leadership. And um, the king's but his father's brother was killed in a mysterious gunshot accident after World War I when there was a lot of uh, turmoil in the, in the government and they were trying to, to so there, there was a force of people who wanted to have a democracy, others wanted to return to absolute monarchy, uh, com there, there was a communist faction and there were people that were still um, very pro-Chinese there. And so the government was at risk and there was a coup uh, led by uh, generals and some of the more proactive citizens. And um, as, a, as a result of that gunshot wound, they needed someone to be king, and they, they found their nephew, the nephew who was uh, planning on becoming a jazz composer, who plays several instruments, who speaks several languages, who was very happily in school in Switzerland when he got the news, and who is uh, interested in mathematics and engineering, a real renaissance person. So in 1946, he went back to Thailand to become king. And he began to learn to be king. And it was a tremendous sacrifice for him because he uh, really enjoyed his avocation, which was, was music. He and his wife have been very strong supporters of the arts in Thailand and throughout the world, just as a result. Um, it, and if I conti continue on him for just a minute, he celebrated his golden jubilee in 1966, and he has he is very very revered by the Thai people. And for example, when you go to a movie at the beginning of the movie, similar to our baseball games, the Thai anthem is played and they show the picture of the king. Everyone stands respectfully with their hands at their side, and they don't. Nobody has to you know in the classrooms today. None of that. Everybody gets up. All Westerners are expected to get up as well. People get hauled off to jail if they do not stand up and, and show their respect. This is how strongly they feel. And actually, um, there are only a few, with, most Thai people are, grow up with this. They feel it. They show their respect. It's not a problem. And every once in a while, they have Westerners that are going to test the boundaries, which is not a smart move in that country. Okay. Um, he married, in 1950, he married Queen Sirikit, who, is, who is, was the daughter of French diplomats. She had been educated very differently, although mostly in Europe as well. She spoke Thai. The king actually had to practice his Thai for a while when he got back to Thailand because he had really not been there very much. And he was very close to his family and very willingly took it on. But she had been trained to be a diplomat and to be in government as a leader. They have four children. Um, they have Crown, Crown Prince, uh, Crown Prince Maha Virjalongkorn, who is named after a king a while ago. Princess Maha Chakri Salindhorn, uh, um, Princess Chuluk Khan, and Princess Ubon Ratsna, Ratasna. The, so they have one son. It is, um, we're not sure, it is unclear if this son will become king to continue the dynasty because about 15, 20 years ago, um, the son was indicating that he didn't want to have to make the choice that his father had made. And so as a result, it is entirely possible that when King Bumipol, who's over 80 at this point, when they lose him, that one of his, that his daughter, Queen, uh, Princess uh, Chula, 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 will uh, ascend the, the throne. So that'll be interesting to see uh, in the future. So the king, uh, the king and, uh, and Queen Sirakit begin to unify their country, and they do it in several ways. He, he is part of government, as you can see from the first page. He has, he has 
He ha his responsibilities include he's head of the armed forces, which is the military, mm -hmm. and he is the head of he's the up. So those are not small roles. <laughs> but he doesn't run the day-to-day -day government. The prime minister, who's um, currently uh, the sister of a, a former prime minister, uh, runs the cabinet ministries and the day-to-day -day government. I know we're not going to get into politics, but let's just say there have been some disagreements about, about that arrangement. Not with the king, but with her and, and um, Thai citizens. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll leave that alone. The, um, Thailand has, they don't have states, they have 76 provinces, and within the provinces they have villages and clusters of villages. So it's very decentralized, self-governing. Uh, to go back to the king and queen, there's something I really want to uh, focus on here is that they have a palace in Bangkok, as one would expect, and they also have an official residence, but not a palace, in each of the regions here to help development in each of the regions. And they spend time each year living in the, these four places, in the northeast, the north, the central, and the south, and they uh, have people come and talk with them. And when you get to have an audience with the king or queen, you are then taught a new language, which is called the High Thai language. And you, you speak, it's a super respectful uh, language that you, would, you wouldn't say, yes, I'd like rice. There's a whole uh, much longer way that you would speak to them, and, and, and just out of respect for them. Now, if I can turn to something else here. So in each, pro in each of the four provinces, they have made an effort to promote economic development and education. And in the south, in where I was, it ha obviously it had to do with um, economic and the fishing industry, and also arts and crafts and women's cooperatives, especially, especially in the south. In the north and northeast, also agricultural, and of course um, a big, big, part of Thailand's uh, industry is, is tourism. But I will say that they also are very blessed with a lot of natural resources, with rubber and tungsten. and they're some of the leaders in, that, in, in the development of uh, manufacturing uh, components for natural resources used in manufacturing. And those facts are on the script that you have. So the king has been very anxious to uh, switch from some of the, some of the poppy production to uh, corn and addition or to rice and soybeans and beans and he's been really active in that and in um, fishing and he's also tried to spend they've spent a lot of money on research and development for different uses for what they grow in terms of medicines and foods and, and uh, nutrition. So this, I'm going to leave this with you, leaving a whole pack of brochures with you to look at, and then this summer when you have camp, you know, if the kids want to cut them up and make collages, and however you want to use them. There's just so many beautiful pictures of Thailand, and about three-fourths of them are beaches, and it's just so much more than that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people love to go there for the beaches. In the um, Northeast, <coughs> The queen has been very uh, helpful to some of the hill tribes and people that here heretofore had been ignored or subjugated. And she's been very conscious of education for them and basic infrastructure. We're talking about running water, clean water, education, uh, and uh, letting and, and encouraging them to teach their children their histories and their arts and music and dance and skills. Okay, let's, let's uh, back to this. And this is the Thai currency. Um, they have the Thai bot is uh, equal to about thirty-one cents, and uh, the the bot is um, in in it's twenty, fifty, a hundred, five hundred, and a thousand in denominations. And the king is featured on all of them, as the king is featured on all the coins. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I will uh, leave this so the kids can see this. Um, I thought we had some of this at home, but we did not. So when the king is no longer king, then do they replace all the currency? No. With, no. no, they'll just gradually, uh, whatever they, when he's not the king, mm -hmm. when they lose him, uh, what what will happen is that any new currency will have the picture of the new leader, okay. but they won't get rid of the old currency. Okay. 
it will probably become keepsake right. items, though. But they, they won't get, they'll just gradually in integrate it. Well, national symbols are the flower, the golden, the golden flower, and uh, as you can see. Although I would add also that what we, what we associate with Thailand are orchids, beautiful, beautiful orchids. Uh, and which I think are beautiful, but when the king or queen or any of the royal family are here and their dinners or anything, the flowers are always orchids that the Royal Thai Airlines <coughs> sends with them to be used for the events that they have here because the queen really likes them a lot. And they're also used in, in um, something I'll show you in just a few minutes when we're talking about holidays. So the elephant is one of the national symbols and um, <coughs> One of the holidays that the Thais enjoy so much is the National Elephant Roundup. And so when I was rereading some of this, I thought that would be a lot of fun for you to do as well. You can do a lot with elephants at summer camp with kids. And they, they have special foods, they have parades, they have elephant dancing contests. So uh, that would be a lot of fun to work with the kids on something like that during that week. And then last is the Salatai, the Thai style arbor. Um, this is a small spirit house that somebody might have in their backyard. Uh, but also many houses in Thailand are still on stilts, especially in the coastal areas. And on the next page, too, it talks a little bit about the Thai elephant. Thai elephants and Indian elephants are, are different animals. And um, it was the Thai elephants. Remember Alexander the Great made his way across Eurasia, and at the very, I don't, uh, I don't remember if you saw the movie or not, but when he got to this part of the world and his the Roman soldiers saw the elephants, they they were taken aback. And at that point, after the, the injuries and losses from those battles, he turned around and started back home. So these, these animals are very much part of the nation's psyche. Um, let, let, I want to put this down just for a minute and tell you a little bit about a couple of kings. That, so the, the kings in Thailand, it was uh, up until uh, uh, prior to World War II, it was an absolute monarchy. And um, various times something would go, the royal crown would go to a cousin or someone else in the family. And when King Mon Khut came to the throne in 18... Let me give you the exact there. In 18, I think it was 1825, he had already been a monk for 20 years. At that time in Thailand, students were educated to become monks. They were educated, if there were Westerners in the country, and there weren't many, they were in the temples teaching. A temple being also called Wat. King Manku had been there for 20 years. He'd been, he was an educator and he was always learning. He had done some traveling. He spoke a little English. He sensed that things were happening in, in this part of the world. He could see that Burma, Cambodia, Cambo Cambodia <laughs> Laos, and Vietnam were all being colonized. He did not want that for his country. And he had the uh, foresight to realize that to, to vocalize that in terms of we have to modernize and we have to start doing things differently. And one of the things that they did was to start making treaties with other countries to help develop their industries. They fought when they had to to keep people out. And he, he felt strongly that they had to start educating their people to be able to function in a different kind of world. So this was pretty forward thinking for someone. And he, in fact, hired uh, teachers, a governess from England to come and teach his son, Prince Chulalongkorn, mm -hmm. and that was the basis for the movie Anna and the King of Siam. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that at all? Yes. The King oh. and I? Pardon? Well, The King and I. The King and I. Mm -hmm. The King and I, Anna. I, I didn't realize, so I was doing a little research for this, that, that there are four versions of that movie. Each one more offensive to the, than the last to the Thais. <laughs> that, that movie has been banned for forever. Yeah. It is banned today because in the movie, it seemed that the, Anna, the 
the governess, Anna Lewin's, mm -hmm. song? Mm -hmm. Lewin songs. It was based on her diaries and, her, and what she wrote. And it made King Mankut look like some kind of a buffoon. And that she and the teachers that had come really educated him and taught him the ways of the world. And that they were very backward people, which of course their civilization was way older than hers. Uh, there's some question about how accurate her writings were. But without question, King Manku was one of the most learned men of his times. Mm -hmm. And they were so, remember this is a country that loves, loves, loves their king. They were mm -hmm. so offended. So several years ago, like maybe 10 years ago, the Queen of Thailand came to Washington. And there was a big dinner for her at the Willard Hotel. And uh, on the, on the um, pillars, there were uh, orchids cascading down the walls. I mean, no expense. And we're talking plane loads of orchids coming for this for this party. And it, she had been here for several days, and I'll tell you one minute. Several, she'd been here several times, and she was in Washington, and it was a thank you dinner for people. And so, in the ballroom, and this was one of those kinds of things where there were a couple of waiters for every table of eight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a couple of waiters. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> so, so the band started playing the song from The King and I. Everybody just froze. Everybody just froze. And the band leader, you could see him looking around because it, people were just appalled. And the minister, and I know, scurried over there like this, right? Right in the middle of a song, right in the middle of a, of a piece. They just stopped and quickly switched to a waltz. <laughs> So that is not the movie to take with you to watch on the plane if you're going over there. Um, King Mankut's son, King Chulalongko, was went, went to Europe twice while he was king. He was very educated. He also spoke different languages. He was a shrewd negotiator, a good diplomat, loved his country, but wanted his country to progress. And he established a school system, not only on the palace grounds, because remember, only the only people were, who were being educated were monks and children of some of the more progressive elites, elites. And he established schools in Bangkok and then throughout the country. And that was the start of kind of the modern day education. Today, they ha education is compulsory through the age of 14. And then further on through high school and college, well, all is available. Bangkok ha itself has 22 universities. <laughs> so education is very important, but it's not state subsidized. Parents have to pay for it. There are always some scholarships, but for the most part, parents have to pay. And, and people consider it an, uh, an, an investment. King Chulalongkorn was, all right, here I found it. King Mankut was 1851 to 1868. He was the president during, he was the king during our civil war. And he, based on the treaty of, of comedy and commerce, and now I see that it's 1833, sent a letter to President Lincoln and offered to send elephants to fight the, to fight the South. <coughs> Wow. Because he, he had elephants that were trained in battle and he wanted to be helpful. <laughs> so, and they have situation. that letter. The letter. <laughs> <laughs> so that could have been a whole other situation. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting the elephants here. <laughs> um, so, um, and just to, um, if I can jump forward just for a minute, I would like to say that. So, for every war, the ties have stood with us in one way or another. And when it came time for World War II, you know, they had. Uh, there had been some issues with Japan, and Thailand had entered into a treaty with Japan in um, the late 30s. And there were trade treaties and safety treaties. And if anything happens, we'll all stand together treaties. And something did happen, Pearl Harbor. And the, um, Thailand actually has sympathies from the king and the government, and most, most people were too. It had not been pleasant uh, having to deal with a lot of Japanese, and, and for a while there were uh, Japanese soldiers there. Um, Japan insisted that Thailand declare war on the United States, which they did not want to do. Tried to figure out every way they could avoid it. So they did declare war on the United States. They just never delivered the document to the United States. And that was their way of just showing displeasure. 
and after the war, they were the only country, in, you know, when the treaties and the after the war, when the treaties were established, they were, they actually picked up land. They did not lose any land, and there were no there was no penalty for them after the war. Of course, you realize what happened to Japan after the war. So, yeah, uh, it was it, it could have been devastating for them. This is how this is how uh, they picked up this part of Nantua because culturally. The South is Malay and Muslim. It's not Buddhist, but it, it but it, it belongs to Thailand at this point. And so, one of the biggest oops, I'm sorry. One of the biggest Buddhas in the country is down here in Nawatiwad. It's it's a, a kind of like a Mount Rushmore kind of thing, and that was built after World War II, just so everybody realized. Who owned the land? Right. No. Okay. So King uh, Chulalongkorn uh, not only started schools, but he abolished slavery. There were other ancient practices that went on there. He abolished that, so it, which changed the structure of the family. He equipped the army with new weapons because they had to fight to defend themselves. And he invested in that. And he revised a lot of government policies with the idea that one of government's responsibilities was to deliver services. This was a new concept. And so he is credited with that. Um, he brought in help from other countries to develop their industries. For example, the German, uh, German consultants were brought in and helped develop um, the beer and beverage industries. Now, the Thailand has very good beer, Singha beer, and very good beers. And one of the reasons is that when they started to develop those industries, they, they, brought, they had German consultants. They brought... Um, English consultants in to help with the uh, uh, railroad, development of the railroads, and they asked French and Belgian consultants, paid them, you know, there was agreements that they had to develop the telegraph and postal systems in that country, which they did not have. The other thing Ching Ko, Ch King Chulalankon did was send his son to England to go to school. His son went to a boarding school, the Harrow School in England, and his son uh, graduated from Oxford University. And his son um, committed to help England and the Allies in World War I. Um, and his son also committed Thailand to be one of the founding members of the League of Nations, which President Wilson was trying to put together, and needed support for that. And so they came forward with that. Um, I want to just give you an idea of some dates. Uh, Chula Longkong, King, uh, King Mongku, was the king from 1868 to 1910. So that wasn't too long of a time. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. King Manku was the king from 1851 to 1868. You don't have to remember these dates, but just in terms of years of change on these three kings. King Manku, 1851 to 1868. King which is from 1868 to 1910. And um, King... His son, Vijay uh, Ravu, uh, until after World War II, until after World War One. After World War One, again there was turmoil, and um, King, when King Viraju did, did not was not there long. When he died, his uh, uh, another cousin, who was ten years old, was named the Prince Regent, and. Soon after that, they had a coup, and that was the, the end of absolute monarchy, the beginning of the constitutional monarchy. Okay. If we can um, go back to the booklet, we were on the page with the Thai elephant. The next one is the Thai greeting, which is the why. It's one of the first things that you learn when you come to um, Thailand, and it is put your, your thumbs in. Thumbs could, in could you and uh, fingers together. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thumbs in and together and, and just sawat di ka is a way of saying hello. Sawat di. It, it is a common greeting coming and going. It does not mean thank you, though. It's a greeting. So, and that's under, that's listed under words and expressions.
Okay, the Thai language is, I have listed some common words on the sheets that you have, and you have, again, some of the words, and you have the letters here, and we have you. The reason I was so anxious to take this is that, I don't know about your summer camp, but at ours, the kids love to draw, and you know, with the Common Core curriculum and a lot of things we have in school <coughs> today, there's really not a lot of time for kind of freeform drawing. And one of Thai children learned to uh, learn to write by copying letters, and I just thought it might be fun for them to do that. And also, um, you can probably find this from a listserv or something. Have the kids have their name in Thai. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if you have even a even a time on a dad or somebody in, in your school or somebody that you know, and you can even give them the names on a placard first, and somebody can take, you can, you know, they don't have to sit there while the person's writing their names in Thai, but it's very fun to see the name in Thai. And these are the, the uh, letters in the alphabet. This is Pang uh, Pang. We'll have this for you as well. Pang Pang. Pang Pang. Pang Pang. Pang Pang. Pang Pang. Pang Pang. Pang and this is one of their national parks. You know, as I was preparing this, I was realizing how Costa Rica has so many national parks. It is so beautiful with all the birds and the beaches and natural wildlife. But in Asia, this is the place. Yeah. This is the place. I mean, they're second in terms of great species of birds, of animals, various animals. They're interesting animals. And um, this is just incredible. Uh, and, and Phuket, if, if you have the chance to go to Phuket, although now it's it's a big city, mm -hmm. but there are three flights a day, whereas before there were three flights a week. <laughs> it's just an incredibly beautiful place. Okay. Um, so this is where we were. Now we're getting to the part I was looking forward to, and, and well, of course looking forward to everything, but uh, to talk about the holidays. And as I thought about the holidays, I was thinking about things that you could do with your students. And um, the holidays and festivals are listed here. And under that, uh, celebrating the festivals, and one of them is Songkran, which is the, the New Year. And it, this is a, a house key a ha in preparation for Songkran. Everybody cleans their houses, they wash their clothes, they get ready. It's a real cleansing time. And part of that is water, water everywhere including parades and festivals, kind of a Mardi Gras kind of environment, except people sprinkle water on each other. Mm -hmm. This is not a case where you throw a bucket on somebody of water, but you they have bowls, you know, people ride around and they sprinkle water on each other as a, um, it's fun. Water it's Wednesday. Fun. It's for two or three days, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have Water Wednesday. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> lots of fun foods, lots of music, lots of crafts, but this is uh, a very, very special, festival. And it's followed by planting the new rice crops. So it's followed by agricultural activity. And on the on the coast, they have, there is on the on the beaches and in many places, they will build structures during Sokran of made of sand castles, similar to sand castles. And on the last day, they come through and they level the entire beach, and all the sand castles and all the sands go out to sea. And that is a symbolic of all the negativity leaving you, all the bad things being cleansed from you and your spirit. So it, it's quite an important and enjoyable holiday. Next, we have the Elephant Roundup. <laughs> The Elephant Roundup is held mid-November in Surin, but if you have elephants anywhere in the country, people celebrate. They decorate their elephants similar as you would a float for the Super Bowl parades or something. Um, pardon? Um, the kids would have fun doing that, making like a giant, a big elephant. Uh, sure, decorating them. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Box and decorating it for the festival. The festival party. The elephants can dance. I mean, you have elephant costumes, elephant masks, mm -hmm. elephant foods. Um, uh, you know, the whole thing with the kids pretending that they're with the trunks doing exercises. And, uh, it's a lot of fun. So that that's followed in, in Serena. And then the other one is Lloyd Breton, which is toward the end of our year. It's usually toward the end uh, in, in mid-November. And it is the, the first full moon of the 12th month. Now, in this country, because that's usually Thanksgiving or cold with Christmas, here in this country, Lloyd Breton is usually celebrated in August or September. And it used to be celebrated in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, in Thailand, it's celebrated throughout the country. There are all kinds of dance and kickboxing and sports and drama demonstrations, parades, lots of special foods and entertainment. And then a big part of that is making their own cretons and putting them, lighting them and putting them in the uh, uh, water and letting them float away, saying the prayers and letting them float away. And I did um, start, now this is kind of a home, These are. this is the shape, I know you recognize it, lotus leaves? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right away, right? Mm -hmm. And this is just styrofoam to make sure it floats. I'm not going to try to float it in here. But <laughs> at camp, we also use the small styrofoam bowls. And our pond is usually a, one of the uh, kitty uh, swimming pools yes. that, that we use. And so you have your, your structure, and with the little bowls, we have the, the lotus leaves, and we paste them on the inside of the bowl. Here I uh, pasted it up, actually taped them because tissue paper and me and styrofoam <laughs> last night, not a good combination. So I just went with the tape. I just went with the tape. But here are the, uh, here's what happens. You have, if you have the real lotus leaves, and it's on something that floats, and you have, uh, you put a candle in, and you put incense in. I want to work the table here. You get the idea. Yeah. Okay. And um, incense. Oh, my this was open. Uh, you, you can put a couple in. Then you put a flower, often orchids or any flower. I just have one that you grab these because I just I think I just have one. I have to take the flowers with me, but I'm gonna leave this with you. Then you put the flowers in. And you and you say your prayer and you do wish it goodbye. And you all you know all your all your wrongdoing is being cleansed at this point. And you put it in the water and you let it float. And so, and it's usually at night when this is happening. And so you light the candle. Go ahead. I won't light the incense because I'm not sure how strong it is. But so it goes, it, it and it goes out on the water. So that is, um, if you don't do any other holiday for Thailand during the camp. You, you, you want to do Lloyd Vuitton. And, um, you know, you can have rice cakes or something with it, however. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. I had to steal those from my Mother's Day thing on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> the flowers, I could, you, you know, you know, but you can make flowers. We okay. make flowers that can't. We make the whole thing except for the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just basic tissue. And now that I've shown you, I don't care if you. No, mango or fall apart. Okay, great. So those are the holidays. Time wise, I think that's okay. okay. So those are the holidays. Um, and uh, here, let's keep going here. So we've got festivals Thai classical dance and arts. There is a, you see the classical characters here in the pictures having to do with the ballet and music. And one of the things that Thailand does in a really special way is wood carving. And I'll, I can send this around if you see it. 
I don't know why I thought I should send that home, but um, the other thing too is their national symbol. Uh, and also, um, from the time ties our children, they are taught, similar in England where the kids learn drawn off from before they can talk hardly, mm -hmm. um, ties are that way with music and musical instruments and dance. And that's just one of the things that boys and girls are taught. And it's surprising that kickboxing is so popular and, the, and that the, the young boys are so good at it because they've been dancing since they were little. <laughs> Could you send those to the Titan? Let's see if I give you. They're very anxious to see pictures. Yeah, I'll send you their address. And they are available to you. Part of what this is is Thank part you. of their sister school program. Mm -hmm. So if you're connected with any schools, they are interested in also have not not so much a sister city program, which um, Bangkok and Washington D.C. are sister cities, but this is sister schools. It's a whole new thing. So your school would be connected with the embassy for purposes of education and just enjoying each other's culture. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, sports and fun. Okay, guys. I lost back there. Okay. Um, this will give you some idea of some of the. Um, sports that, that uh, Thai students enjoy. I would say kickboxing, not kickboxing, but um, takra, which this is a takra ball. It's a small rattan ball. And you play with this, but you never hold it in your hands. Similar to soccer, you don't. Thank you. This, so this is by far the most popular game. It takes place every time a teacher turns their back. <laughs> wow. Every hotel corridor, every schoolyard break, everything. Okay. And um, what we do at camp, because uh, the, um, it, is, it, is not, it is not as light as a ball, we get the mini beach balls, and we let the kids decorate them and put their names on them, and then we blow them up. And you know, we're talking just the with, like from Oriental Trading or something, mm -hmm. the smaller size beach ball. Mm -hmm. And but do encourage people to put their names on them before you. It, it can cause issues. <laughs> and also, uh, in the style of Thailand, they decorate them before they. Do them. Sometimes the paint and stuff sticks. Sometimes. It, uh, but that is uh, very important. They love flying kites. The boys get into kickboxing very, very early. Lots of water sports, swimming, boat racing. They love sailing. The king is an avid sailor, incidentally. They love sailing. Um, they love dancing. They race with beetle bugs, crickets, Bulls, water buffaloes, very competitive gambling environment, yeah, environment with kids, right from the start, right from the start. And then a uh, big, big national sport, of course, is golf. And, kids, um, and Tiger Woods, of course, is one of their heroes because his mom is Thai. Okay. Um, they, boys and girls, learn, learn to sew and crochet and to make things with their hands. Girls go on to learn on a uh, um, uh, uh, beautiful presentation is very important, especially with food. So often you'll have carrot slices in the form of a flower. Yeah, very, very much. So the girls learn that, and the boys go on to making uniforms to compete in. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm similar to almost all our sports, I, you know, I hate to say, we, we don't encourage kickboxing at camp during the summer for some obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do encourage takra and uh, soccer. Okay. And should we move on to foods, which we could stay on for a long, long time. Um, it's a rice-based diet. <laughs> and uh, often, though, Thais will have noodles for lunch. So rice for breakfast, rice for lunch, rice for dinner, rice for the midnight snack, sometimes a little variation. Sweets in the afternoon, because they eat dinner later. And I brought, uh, I've got a list here of some of the favorite foods and also some meals based on the region. Obviously the south is going to be more seafood, 
and the, and the north more agricultural and, and farm crops. But rice is grown everywhere. Um, the thing about um, Thai dishes are the spices that are used. Mm -hmm. Fish sauce being one of the major spices and very, a lot of salt content there. Mm -hmm. But when, a Thai, when Thais are figuring out a meal, they have the elements of sweet, sour, salty, sugary, and bitter. And so you've got those five elements. Um, I've listed foods here that people enjoy. Oh, the, spi the rest of the spices are um, basil. Oh, yeah. Ten more minutes? Okay. Let me show you this picture. These are some Thai dishes. Oh, yummy. Uh, they are delicious. They are delicious. You, you recognize the pot thai right here, which is the basic one. Very popular mm -hmm. here. Um, um, you acclimate to spicier foods when you're here. It is spicy. A lot of the foods that we have here are somewhat uh, sugared up mm -hmm. for us, but it's, they're not necessarily a sweet space diet. This would be a seafood prawn a curry. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a chicken. This is sweeter than chicken and onions and uh, peanuts. There's a little Malay influence on this one. This would be spicy. Mm -hmm. Curries are red and green, usually based on the spices that are used, and it's usually based on coconut milk and vegetables and some meat, but not always. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Um, they eat really healthy, so the lifespan of um, Thai people, they're long. The king. Without a lot of illness. I was looking at the no. king. He's well, he obviously gets good food. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I bet good yeah. medical care. Okay. Yeah, that too. Right. And obesity is. That. Not so much. Not so much. And they blame that on the Western culture. Mm -hmm. You know, when kids are overweight, it's because they're eating bread or sweets or... Mm -hmm. They don't eat, have the kind of soda, whatever, that we do. They have in the morning, and, and kids will also have the, um, a chocolate drink in the morning with canned milk. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, don't, they drink a lot of water. It's very, very hot. It's not uncommon to take two or three showers a day. So I would say relatively healthy, although they do not, they, ha they have a good health care system, but you have to, it, it, it has taken time to develop it. And the kids like sweets. I mean, they, they can buy, you, there are a lot of Western foods available now there. You know, in England, we'd have the, you know, like gummy bear sweets and like you know, little Coke bottles with a little shot of Coca-Cola with all the sugar and everything. That is just as common there. Mm -hmm. Not so much chocolate, though, because, of course, it's hot. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so th this talks a little bit about the taste. Um, you've got a food chart there. Native animals. I've listed the animals there. Mm -hmm. I would say, for for your purposes, they have the um, biggest population. Or second, scientists as that Thailand has 10% of the world's species of birds, of fish, 5% of reptiles, and 3% of all the amphibians in the world, which is a pretty high rate. Uh, and so you've got elephants, water buffaloes, monkeys, butterflies, peafowl, which is a kind of a pigeon, fish, coral, lizards. So there's a lot to work with at camp in, in terms of the animals. The Asia, the um, uh, Thai elephants that were big, they're, they're not minis, they're not minis, they're not small. The Indian elephants are kind of small. Okay. All right. They've got, and they, they have uh, f fighting fish. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, natural scenery. I'm going to uh, take. Uh, I'm going to stop with this. You can look at this. On the last page shows President uh, Obama with King Bumipol, who is he visited him when uh, he was in Thailand last. So two very loved world leaders together there. And when, when the Washington Monument was being built, Thailand sent one of the cornerstones. Wow. Contributed, I guess I should say. Okay, so uh, we have this. I'd like to just show you a little bit more. Some of the products of Thailand are um, celadon. This is a cracked celadon, and I brought these two because these are the shapes of lotus leaves. Um, this, this, well, I'll get back to this in a minute. And uh, you can you'll you know that they do uh, lacquerware, Mielloware, 
um, they do bronze. This is a bronze bowl on the bottom, and this is just the basic lacquerware. The reason I wore this necklace is that this is a kind of you know lacquer jewelry that they make. This is a sample of embroidery from uh, the uh, Indian Hill Tribes. One of the things that people associate with Thailand is um, silk, this fabric silk. And you're welcome to take this out if you want. And, and what I would say about silk, if you're trying to do something during camp, is to uh, take pieces of silk and give them a blah and let them decorate that block of silk and then put it on some kind of background, whatever, because silk feels different than cotton and what they're, what they're used to. This is uh, silk and material that would be used for part of the national dress. And um, this is, again, they also are very skilled at batiking, Thai images on batiking. Mm -hmm. And I have knots. Now, and the reason I brought, excuse me, I brought this to show you is that um, although the Usually, a batik is a pretty freeform thing. This is not at all. I mean, they put definite images on these things. Oh, yeah, they're beautiful. So I've got these to send around. And this would be another example of a hillside embroidery. Um, just tell me when we've got to. OK. Um, this is trying to get out of it. What works what? How do you separate? Um, Holidays and I'll say um, gestures that are done for religious purpose versus cultural purpose. I'm not sure there is that much of a separation. I mean, they're a very religious country, but you know, Buddhism is, does not demand of its followers the way being Catholic or Jewish would be. Okay. It's a much more kind of relaxed. Uh, but I, I will say this, not getting into the religion too deeply, that most males are monks at some point in their life, often before they get married, because that's just one of the ways that you prepare for, to be to sacrifice. Mm. Uh, and uh, also, uh, in terms of just reflective time, that being a monk is part of their entrance to manhood. Are we out of time? We need questions. Okay. As you're wrapping up, thank okay. you. I'm sorry, I'm trying to think. Oh, quite all right. I brought too much. Um, this is a, just to give you an idea of those kinds of, if you went there and bought silk. And um, this, again, is some of the fabric. Are you leaving that for us as well? No. <laughs> what did she say? I was asking if she's going to leave that for us as well. Session. Yeah. What? What? This is again. This is uh, just that. This is not. This is just. This is printed. 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 Here you go. So pretty. Mm -hmm. So I, I. I hope I can answer your questions. I'm not sure. And just one more thing I want to show you is that. Uh, another thing for drama that they have is uh, shadow puppets, and this, these are the shadow, these are usually made from leather, this is paper, this is very doable for camp in terms of, you know, punching, this is all punched out, this, these images, and you can cut them. What are they called? Shadow puppets. These are very, very old. And these are mythological, this is the... Trickster. Are they easy to make? These are, uh, I think for children they can be easy to make because you wouldn't have as much cutting and detail, but yes, you can make these. Where can we buy them? You cannot. I don't think you can buy them here. Okay. Unless you can, you, you better take a trip to Thailand before camp starts. That's <laughs> it. I think that's about that. The other thing is that they are made is, is uh, and I have several of these big at home. This again, and this is buffalo hide. They made out of dried buffalo hide. And these are done by, um, you know, they put a, 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 a print up, up right there, and then they hammer it in to cut the, 
to cut oh, the leather oh, out. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It's very arduous. And, they're, and, and you know, yeah. even 25 years ago, they were very concerned because young people did not want to learn that skill. And to go back to the wood carving, this is another. Yeah, I think that was made out of. I wouldn't think it's such a big thing. Just pencil molds. And then this is the, the other kind of wood carving. It's the same. I like that. I like that very much. Oh, cooking. So I brought my wok, just so you could see what, just on a hot plate kinds of things to cooking. Oh, yeah. This is used for steaming. Oh gosh. And current steam steamer to me. A lunch but a lunch box, a lunch bucket. Oh, yeah. This is oh, uh, wow. and the and the top comes off and then the food would just be in here in little packages or little wow. containers. That would be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So lots of things you can do with the kids. And then one final I don't know if I gave you this or not. Um, when I was at Merch uh, this week the geography teacher was doing different cultures, and I thought you might want to do one of these each week, your own puzzle based on you know, these categories or any other that you have, and so that they could do a puzzle for Thailand, pictures of the flag or the foods or some of the letters or something, just, just based on any of these categories. So, can you pass these around? Yes. So, I'm good? Can I have any questions? Any questions? Yes. Any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you.